listening online, uh, may you sense God's presence this morning. I just want to take a moment uh, this morning and thank the uh, food committee and and the uh, trustees and the folks that take care of things when we have funerals. Uh, I know that many of you have have done many extras. And I was just struck as I was sitting here reflecting uh, on Brother Eli passing and, and having the funeral uh, memorial this afternoon and, and the ones that we've had here and, and the testimony that is being left. But as I look across church, God is faithfully blessing. The church house is full of little children, babies and uh, families. And, you know, as... As we reflect on the life of Brother Eli and, and, and Brother Roy and John and, and Levi and Sil and see uh, Norman, the brother of sisters back there, we just, we've seen many people passing on. But the young children that are being born today are a testimony of God's faithfulness because he's equipping the next generation. Uh, and I just am been blessed in my studies this week. And I'm going to do something today that I've never done before. I'm going to preach a sermon out of one verse today. And that verse is Proverbs 14.30. If you would, you can turn with me to that. If you want to stand with me, we'll read this verse together. Proverbs 14, verse 30. A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. Let's pray. Father, we ask that your presence be here this morning. We thank you for each person attending. We pray for your hand to be over us today. May your word go forth. Give, give us strength to share what you've given. And I just pray your blessing upon this service. Pray for the Eli Yoder family this afternoon as they lay uh, Brother Eli to rest. And we just thank you for his testimony and for your word, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. How many of you know what to believe today? It's good to wear a mask. It's not good to wear a mask. It's you obey the governor's mandate, you don't obey the governor's mandate. How many of you have heard those conversations? Can anyone in here stand up and clarify it for all of us this morning? You know, there's, there's a lot of controversy. And the title of my message this morning is called A Tranquil Heart. And it's uh, taken from Proverbs 13, uh, 1430. A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. And the ESV says, a tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. And I had to think about, uh, there is one thing that all of us can focus on, and we know what to believe. There is still truth in this world, and it stands as strong today as it ever has. It is unchanging, it is faithful, it is the Word of God, and it is the living Word, Jesus Christ, and His Father, and the Holy Spirit that is among us. There is no change in these things. And even though you're going to hear all kinds of opinions today, and on the questions I ask you, you're not, you may have the answers in your mind. But you're going to run into someone else that has the answers just as strong the other direction. Any of you found that out? You have an answer, 
and you meet people that their answer is just as strong the opposite direction of your answer. But there is one answer that is true, and that is Jesus Christ. I want to take a look at, at what the Scripture is saying about the heart. According to the Bible, the heart is the center not only of spiritual activity, but all activities of the human life. You, you hear many times in, in the Bible that uh, it is referred to, the heart is referred to as the center of someone's person. The heart is the home to the personal life. In the way, and then that way, we designate people according to their heart. We, we notice when someone is upright and righteous. We can sense pure activities, pure motives. And these come out of the heart of a person. You can also tell when someone is deceitful. Maybe not at first. But after some interaction with a person, if a person has a deceitful heart, you will pick up on it. Do you gravitate towards people and interactions with people with a deceitful heart? You know you're going to be taken when you interact with them. But we're characterized by what is believed to be in our heart. And the interesting thing is that the heart is an internal condition and written like that in the scripture that our heart is that internal thing that cannot be seen about us but it's reflected in how we live the Bible talks about the heart being naturally wicked it's not that our heart naturally gravitates to righteousness in Genesis 8.21, after the flood, when Noah built the altar and had the sacrifice made on the altar, God smelled the savor from the altar, and this is what he said. He smelled Noah's sacrifice, and he said, in Genesis 8.21, verse B, in part B of that verse, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. It gives you a little bit of a picture of man's heart. And how many times do we go through life and we see people where everything on the outside looks perfectly good and then there's an incident and something happens and we're blown away but what has happened with that person. But on the inside, there was something going on. And it's not, we're not supposed to be surprised by that. You know, if man's heart is evil, and his imagination is evil from youth, then it must be changed. The only way that that heart can be changed is through salvation. And salvation simply comes through, and I'm again going to turn to Romans chapter 9, 10, verse 9 and 10, and read those verses. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Because listen, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You know that, in order for us to do what's right, in order for us to have a sound heart, as Proverbs said, we have to have that change through salvation. There has to be a change to the heart. If man's heart is evil and imagines evil from youth, then there must be a change. There must come a change to that heart in order for it to be sound. Salvation begins in the heart by believing the testimony of God. It starts by believing what God has said. You know, there are so many things being said today. 
it is hard to believe what's being said. It's hard to know what is truth and what's not truth. It's difficult to try to separate what's going on in our society, which facts are facts and which is just made up for the moment. You can hardly put your finger on what is true anymore. But that's not the case in here. It's very simple here that the Word of God simply says that salvation begins in the heart and that the heart is wicked. And unless it's changed, there is no possibility for sin to be taken care of. Salvation begins in the heart by believing the testimony of God. Rejecting this testimony brings hardness of heart. And what are some of the evidences of a hard heart, you would say? Well, one of the things that's going to be evidence of a hard heart, there's going to be a light view of sin. Sin's going to be casually looked at. It's not that big a deal. Sin isn't that terrible. Ah, it's just a little thing. You know, I can dabble a little bit. It, it's okay. I, my conscience and the Holy Spirit is speaking to me. I shouldn't be involved in that, but you know what? It's not that big a deal. If there's hardness of heart, sin is not going to be taken seriously. You know, sin destroys. Sin destroys people and families and nations. Sin destroys. And a hard heart is going to take a light view of sin. It's not that big a deal. A hard heart will only partially confess sin. Keep it as pretty looking as possible. I was convicted when I studied this. You know, we, it is so hard to confess and just exactly expose what can go on inside your heart. But the Lord says, come to me. You know, he says, just come as you are. So easy to confess just enough to keep it looking okay. And that's, that can be a sign of a hard heart. Pride and conceit are another thing that can come into the heart and harden it. The fourth thing that can come from a hardened heart is an unconcern about the Word of God. Where does your Bible lay in the week? Where is this in your life, in my life? Do I quickly grab it and get my couple minutes of easing conscience in? Or am I connecting with God? When I pick up the Word of God, am I connecting with God? It was interesting this morning, the question came up uh, in our Sunday school, do we still have prophets today? And I was struck by that. You know, we have a Word of God. We have people speaking prophecies today, and, and, you'll, hear, and, and you'll hear things like, wow, maybe that's going to happen. But the truth of the... The truth of the Word of God is that we have the revealed Word here, and you and I can open this in our living room, and we, can, we don't need a prophet to speak to us. We can connect with God right here in the Word of God, all by ourselves. He's made that possible through Jesus Christ and His written Word. Do you have a concern for the Word of God? Is the Word of God part of your life? So these are all things that are part of what the Scripture speaks about when it speaks about the heart. What does the word sound mean? Sound in this text means entire, unbroken, not shaky. So a sound heart is entire, it's unbroken, it's not shaky. Another word would be undecayed, whole, perfect, not defective. You know, when we run into decayed items, I don't know if you've ever gone to the fridge and you open a container and there's a decayed item. Now, this is no reflection on the ladies at all. 
these things happen. What is your reaction when you run into a decayed item? Anybody can make a face? Can anybody make a face of what happens? Almost all of you probably do something with your face when you come into a decayed item. Am I right or wrong on that? Do you, do you, do you make a facial... You know, it's kind of... You contort your face. You don't want to see... You don't want to smell. You want to put away something that is decayed. If our heart is not sound, we may be able to hide that decayed item for a time. But that decay will show. If the heart is not sound, there will be decay. We had a tree in our backyard. Uh, it was a nice, big, wild cherry tree. And it looked really nice. It was a very nice tree. But I noticed with time, it seemed to lean towards the house. And as Myron can testify, anything that could lean towards a house, you don't want, you don't want that to happen. After a while we cut this good-looking tree down and pulled it the other direction, thankfully. And when we cut through the middle and got the tree down, we found what was happening in the center, the very center, was starting to be hollow and had decay. On the exterior, there was no way of knowing by looking at that tree except that it began to lean a little bit the wrong direction. I think there are indicators on the outside that something on the inside is beginning to decay in our lives as well. And it is important that we take heed to those little things. And the Bible says here that envy is the thing that causes this. And I'm going to read what the dictionary, a Bible dictionary said about envy. It is pain, uneasiness, mortification, or discontent excited by the sight of another superiority or success, accompanied with some degree of hatred or malignity, and often or usually with a desire or effort to depreciate the person, and with pleasure seeing him depressed. Envy springs from pride, ambition, or love mortified that another has obtained what one has a strong desire to possess. So when one has a strong desire to possess something, and another one gets it, there is a buildup of envy. Now, I would say, you would probably sit here and say, Judd, what does envy got to do with me? I... I don't struggle with envy. Now, children don't hide their envy. They reach out and they take. When their envy hits them, they get a hold of what they want and they take it from another. I mean, it's real evident. It doesn't... Uh, and how many of you parents have to teach that to your children? Do they, they need the teaching? Brother Daniel, do your children need that teaching? They need the opposite teaching, right? It is so naturally part of what... And yet, maybe as we get older, we just put more layers over top. Think of that tree. If there's a hollow in the center, and there's only layers added to the outside, and if that heart is not changed, remember, the imagination is wicked from the youth. God says that about man. But if there's only layers added to the outside, that decay is there. And so envy must be dealt with by the Lord in our life. So in this verse, we have two concepts. We have one that brings life and one that brings rottenness to the bones. And it's interesting that they're both unseen. Now, we see little evidences of it. I had to think of the example of the wall that was built uh, by Berlin Gardens. We rent there from Sam at Berlin Gardens. And they, they built a wall this summer. 
Um, and it is 21 feet high. And when you look at that wall, it you know, driving past it now, it, it just looks pretty nice, and you don't see. But we got to watch firsthand as this wall was built because it came very close in some places. Um, but first of all, there was a huge uh, space dug out for this wall. And then there was a footer put in, and this footer was 12 feet wide and a minimum of two feet thick, filled with rebar all tied together and then rebar coming up where the wall was going to be. And, and, then the, and then the rebar was built all the way up for the wall, 21 feet high. And then the forms put on. You know, and, and then when they went to pour this wall, they poured it all in one pour. So it's all uh, cured together. But that wasn't the end of it. Uh, the forms had to be taken off. And... It had to cure for a number of weeks. And then drainage put in to make that water gets away. And materials put behind it that don't allow pressure to be put on, on the wall after it was backfilled. So when you look at the wall now, you see the surface of it. But if that wall is going to stand, there has to be much more behind it and underneath it to, than what meets the eye. And I think when we think of a sound heart... My mind went to that wall. I would be very scared of that wall if it only would go down into the ground straight and if the builders of that wall would have only focused on the forms and the outside finish. I would not want to be on top of it or underneath it if that was the case. If the only focus would have been the exterior finish, and there would have gone down to no foundation. It would have absolutely no value. It is the things that are unseen that gives the wall its value. And that is true in our lives too. The things that are not seen, the Christian life. If you want to, you can turn with me to Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I want to take a look at, at that scripture. Paul is talking to the Corinthians, and I had to think, you know, they have a little bit going on, maybe what we do. One person says one thing. He talks to them in the first part of that chapter. He says, you're saying, you're carnal, because some of you are saying, well, I, I listen to Paul's teaching. I listen to Paulus. Well, I follow this. I follow that. And they were confused, and they were getting at each other. But in verse 11, I want to start there. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon the, this foundation gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burnt, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Paul is saying here, there is a foundation laid. There is truth. And we spoke about that earlier. There is a foundation in Jesus Christ that is truth and is solid. And it can be built upon. What we build on there is where our part comes in. Is it wood, hay, and stubble? Is it precious stones, gold, or silver? And I think what the writer is saying here is that there are things that we involve ourselves in that take our time that are kingdom building. They are precious stones. They're going to stand forever. Activities that are going to last forever. Impacts we're going to make for eternity. There are activities we may involve ourselves in that are wood, hay, and stubble. If you light a fire and you build the fire with rocks, what happens? 
It's not going to burn very long. You put wood, hay, and stubble in there, there's going to be a tremendous fire, and that material is going to be gone, and the rocks that are left, I, I, did the, I thought I could be kind of a coronavirus buster. I, I tried this at my home. I had a fire, and I burned wood for a very long time, and then I did the old-fashioned sauna. I put rocks in that fire, and I got them bright red hot, then I made myself a little tent and sat in it and took in the steam off of these hot rocks. And uh, unfortunately, it, it, it was maybe a bit of a myth, but I, I did accomplish it. Um, you know, there's many myths out there that you have to try. Um, but the fact is, when that fire was finished, the only thing left in there was the rocks. And believe me, these things uh, were red hot all the way through and we had some good steam let's just put it that way and it was a good good cleansing experience even if it didn't uh, take care of the coronavirus but you know that is what our life is compared to those things we build upon that are eternal will stand those things that we focus on that are worldly and only good for this world are not going to stand. Though, if we believe in Jesus Christ, we can still be saved. The problem is, what about what is left for the generation coming after us? And one thing I want to say, you may hear a lot of things about this being in the last days. I don't know if any of you have heard things like that. But don't live like we're living in the last days. Yes, do, waiting for Jesus Christ. But your children are coming behind you. A thousand years is as a day in the eyes of the Lord, and a day is a thousand years. We can't stop living. Just because we might be coming into the end times. I don't know. Don't stop living. Keep spreading the name of Jesus Christ and building for your family. Because we don't know when the Lord's going to come back. Yes, sometimes it feels like things are happening. But let's not stop living. We have the name of Jesus Christ to take out there. And we have families to leave a legacy for. If you stop living, you're going to leave wood, hay, and stubble. Your family needs a foundation that's stone and precious metal. And I believe... We've laid to rest quite a few people who have left that for us. We need to pick it up and continue building. It is so easy to get in the mindset, well, it's the end day, you know, kind of a fatalistic mindset. But we don't want to live there. And I believe God is calling us to have a sound heart that we can live in the day he's called us to live in. I want to just quickly yet in this sermon take a look at a group of people where this Scripture lived itself out. And it's the story of Joseph and his brothers. Um, and that story is in Genesis. And as quite a bit of Genesis is dedicated, the story of Joseph. But it's the story of Joseph. And I'm going to take a look at Joseph and the development of a sound heart in Joseph. I don't have time to read a lot of the story, but I'm going to turn to uh, Genesis 41 is where I'm going to turn to because I want to bring something out that Pharaoh said to Joseph. <coughs> After Pharaoh had his dreams and Joseph was brought to him, Joseph spoke in chapter 40. He spoke to Pharaoh in verse 25, no, 41, sorry. Verse 25, And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, The dream of Pharaoh is one. God has showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. So the dream, there were two dreams, one with the seven fat cows and the seven thin cows coming out of the river, and they ate the seven fat cows. After this, seven Stalks came up with seven fat heads of grain and then thin, nasty-looking 
wiry stalks with thin heads of grain, and the thin heads of grain ate the fat heads of grain. So this was the dream that Pharaoh had, as many of you know. Joseph says, this is one dream. This is one word from the Lord, and the reason for two dreams is because God is verifying this is going to happen. This is going to stand. So Joseph just starts in, he says to Pharaoh, and we're not going to take time to read it, but he tells him about the famine. And in verse 33, notice what Joseph says. He's not even worried that this is the Pharaoh. He just tells him what to do. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise and set him over the whole land. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. Let them gather all the food of those good years that come and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. And that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land perish not throughout the famine. Joseph just speaks up. He says, Pharaoh, this is what you should do. Now, if that was the only part of Joseph you would know, you would say, wow, this guy is incredible. But how did this develop in Joseph? Well, we go back, look at the things he went through. At a young age, he was loved more by his father than the other brothers. And he wanted to do what's right, but he, he told on his brothers. And you know what? We notice these things happen to him. But if we go forward, he was sold, he was hated, he was put in prison because of a false statement, because he stood for what was right. He was forgotten in prison after he asked people that he did a favor for by interpreting their dreams to help him, and he was forgotten there. And that's when he shows up on the scene. And you can see that there was something developed inside of Joseph. Notice what Pharaoh said. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh, in verse 37, and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? Can we find one such as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? You know, folks, when people interact with you, what do they walk away saying? Wow, he's got it all together on the outside. Or, you know what? There's something about him or her that I'm not sure, I can't see what it is, but there's something different about that person. I don't think the world's going to know that that comes from you spending time in the Word of God. Now, his brothers were the exact opposite. They had envy. You know, the interesting thing about Joseph and his brothers, Joseph was hurt by his brothers. But his brothers were hurt by Jacob, Joseph's father. It says clearly that Joseph was Jacob's favorite. And he got this beautiful coat to show that favor. And Joseph wore it. I don't know if he twirled around and spun around in the thing. But it says that his brothers hated him. And could not speak peacefully to him. His brothers had such, they longed for that favor from their father, obviously. And they were not treated right. It is not right to have favoritism. So there was, there was a wrong there that happened to his brothers. But notice the difference. They turned to hatred and envy and could not speak peaceably and as I read this story this week, again, it just struck me. 
and tears came as these brothers recognized. Notice Joseph. He was wronged as well by the brothers who hated him. But every time he was wronged, he saw and let God work in his life and recognize that he was being placed here. God had a purpose each time. His brothers took the hurts. And I believe Joseph was able to let go of those hurts because he focused on God. When his brothers came to Egypt to get food, what he said to them was, you didn't do this. God did this for this purpose. But what did his brothers say? See, when there's forgiveness, we can see God's hand in what goes in our lives. When there's envy and hatred and bitterness, we can only remember the things and the guilt that we have. The brothers had that. In verse 21 of verse 42, I want to read that here in closing. And they said one to another, after Joseph had accused them of being spies, they said to each other, We are verily guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the anguish of his soul. And when he besought us, we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. You know, guys, uh, folks, when Joseph was sold into Egypt, I believe he screamed and yelled and begged and cried. The anguish of his soul to his brothers, don't do this to me. I'm your brother. And they rejected those pleas. But those brothers could not forget that. That stayed with them. And when, when Joseph tested them, that came back. But Joseph, because he had allowed God to work in his heart and allowed his heart to become sound by forgiving, he was able, when his brothers came, to look at them and say, you didn't do this. God did this, and he's prepared me for this. So the challenge to each one of us is, the things we're going through, these things that build strength on the inside don't often come from easy things. The things that build strength on the inside almost always come from difficult things in our lives and tests and trials. How we respond and accept those is the difference between our heart being sound or us being filled with envy, wishing our life could be like someone else's. And that brings rottenness to the bones. Is our heart sound before the Lord today? And uh, just as we think of Thanksgiving this week, let's be thankful for what we have. Even if we're going through difficult times, let's be thankful for what God has given us. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, Proverbs 14, verse 30. Lord, help us to let you work in our lives in this time and that our lives would be sound as Joseph allowed. Lord, if there's things that, that we're envious of others, and we look around and we wish it was different for us, Lord, help us to lay those down at your feet and allow you to work so that we can be found as precious stones in the day when you come to take us home. Lord, we just commit each thing today to you. We pray for the Yoder family as they have a memorial this afternoon. And we just ask that your guidance in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to open it briefly. Um,